so sorry not to be with you in person. I will do my best to uh, give a talk that is hopefully understandable and hopefully interesting enough to hold your attention. After the pandemic, we are all sick and tired of learning by video, but let's make the best of it and do what we can. Since I'm not sure how much of a delay there is, since I'm not sure how well the sound quality is, is turning out, if I'm speaking too fast, then just interrupt me, give me some feedback. We okay? Great. Glad to hear that. Okay, then. Let's start off with a little bit of an outline of what I would like to do in this mini course. I'm going to start at a weird place. I'm going to start by talking about calculus. Why? <laughs> well, that, that's most of what I do, and that's mostly how I think about things. I'm going to spend much of today's first lecture just doing simple introductory examples of cellular sheaves as a a basis, a platform on which we can build tomorrow and the next day. If you just listen to today's lecture, you're going to think that there's not much deep mathematics going on. But by the time we get to the end of this course, I hope to point you to some interesting open problems that have some non-trivial mathematical content. Okay, so let's get started. I want to talk about calculus. I spend so much of my time and energy thinking about calculus, and it has a non-trivial intersection with what I want to talk about in this mini course. Let me start off with something that probably everybody already knows, and that is how to count, or at least how to count in the Euler characteristic way. If I just give you a collection of dots, of vertices, and ask a child to count them, they're going to compute the Euler characteristic. They're just going to say there's nine dots there. If I start connecting some of the dots and say, how many pieces are there? Then, in this case, connecting two of the dots together, there's an argument to be made that there are now eight things that I'm counting. As I add more and more connections between these dots, then the number of things that I'm looking at, the number of pieces, is going down, matching what the Euler characteristic does. From this, you would infer that dots or vertices should count with a positive weight, and edges should count with a negative weight. And that works great until we get to the point where we draw something like this. And now you might argue that there are four pieces here, but the algebra would argue that there are really only three things that you have counted because of the fact that an edge has negative weighting. So what do you do about this? Well, one thing that you could do is look at that hole that you've created, fill it in, and then say, you know, if we assign a positive weight to that two-dimensional simplex, to that triangle, to that face, then we get back to what we think we ought to be counting, which is four pieces. This is all kind of uh, stupid and ridiculous, but it is motivation for the combinatorics of how you set up the Euler characteristic as the alternating sum of the numbers of vertices, edges, faces, or in our language, the dimensions of the chain complex groups, the spaces that you get by using the vertices, the edges, the faces as basis elements, and then computing the dimensions of these, let's say, vector spaces. OK, that's great. But then why does the Euler characteristic have such wonderful topological invariance properties? Well, again, you and I know that this is because it is related to homology. Or for purposes of what 
we're going to be interested in, we're going to use cohomology with compact support. Why would we want to do that? What I want is to capture this idea that a vertex has Euler characteristic plus one and an edge, a single open edge, has Euler characteristic negative one, which if you use cohomology with compact supports to define the Euler characteristic in that case, then yeah, the topology and the combinatorics work out correctly. Now I said I wanted to do calculus. This isn't calculus, this is counting. But counting, of course, is the beginning of calculus because counting is a evaluation. By valuation, I mean that if you look at the Euler characteristic of a union of two things, then you can decompose it as the sum of the Euler characteristics of the pieces minus the Euler characteristic of the intersection. This works when we're looking at simplicial or cell complexes. When we use this combinatorial definition or this cohomological definition with compact supports. Now this property of being a valuation is shared with counting, with length, with area, with volume, with measure in general. And so the motivation for where I want to go next is what could you do to turn the Euler characteristic into a measure? Now, it's not going to be an honest measure. We can't do sigma algebra type stuff. It can take on negative values, so it's not quite proper, but we can, if we get out a hammer, bang out an integration theory using Euler characteristic as a measure. This is an idea that was popularized by Shapira and Vero, uh, going back to work by Kashiwara, McPherson, and has since taken on a life of its own. To build an integration theory, we need measurable sets. In this case, these are gonna be sets that we can make sense of Euler characteristic with nicely. These are going to be called constructible sets, or for a nice concrete example, look at semi-algebraic sets. So that's going to be nice. We can decompose them into collections of cells. The measurable functions are going to be very different than what we see in calculus. The measurable functions are called constructible functions. They're going to be piecewise, constant, integer-valued functions. So things that just take on an integer value and they're constant over strata in some stratification. With that in place, the Euler integral, the integral with respect to Euler characteristic is simply the homomorphism from the constructible functions on some space x to the integers that does what an integral ought to do. It satisfies all the properties of being evaluation. We can very concretely describe it in terms of a basis. If we look at indicator functions over cells, that's what I mean by that uh, one with the subscript A, then the integral of an indicator function with respect to any measure, it's just the measure of the function. In this case, the Euler characteristic of that cell. If you use that as a basis and define the Euler integral to be the induced homomorphism, then you get a fairly honest integration theory. Now, why do I say that this is an integral when it's really just combinatorics in disguise? I think this really does deserve the moniker of being an integral for a couple of reasons. One, there's a Fubini theorem. We know that the Euler characteristic behaves multiplicatively under a Cartesian product. From that, one gets immediately that if you want to compute an integral over the product of two spaces, you can project down to the base and integrate the fibers 
and then integrates that sum over the base. The same way that we teach to our calculus students when they're trying to figure out double and triple integrals. There are well-defined and really cool integral transforms with this Euler characteristic measure. You can do convolution, you can do Fourier transforms, you can do Redon transforms, all kinds of cool stuff. For more information on that, check out some of the original papers by Shapira, in which he, he really launched the subject way ahead of its time. This language of Euler calculus really unlocks a lot of what's going on in integral geometry. The Gauss-Binet theorem, for example, has a, a, an emanation in terms of Euler calculus that works not just for surfaces or manifolds, but for semi-algebraic sets, for piecewise linear things involving discrete curvature and everything in between. There's a really nice paper by Brooker and Koopa that outlines this without some of the Euler characteristic integration language. But if you do it right, the Fourier transform shows up and it's chef's kiss, so beautiful. One other reason why this is an honest integration theory in my mind is that it has a lot of applications to signal processing problems. And this is where some of my work with Yuli Baryshnikov got started. What do I mean by this? Well, think back to something that is probably way before your time, but not before mine. That is the, uh, the ridiculous uh, Minesweeper game where what you're doing is looking at a constructible function, an integer valued function that's constant over cells, and you're trying to infer information from a sampling of that function. That information being where the bombs, based on the footprints that those bombs make, you're getting information about how many bombs are nearby. That's sort of a uh, an old, stupid, but kind of fun game. Imagine a more topological version of this that doesn't have the geometry built in so much, where you can get information about how many patches are overlapping or intersecting, where these patches are now not rigid squares, but something more topologically uh, stretchy. Now, this isn't all that surprising. You look at that and you can count in your head and say there are seven contractible patches. But what happens if instead of this nice picture, we do a sampling of it. Now, where these dots are color-coded by the depth, it's not so easy for your brain to process this and say, oh, this is seven patches that are overlapping. Yet, there's still enough information to be able to conclude that. If you did an even sparser sampling over a network, now it's really not clear how you would proceed but if you set this problem up in terms of integration, in terms of calculus, then you can hopefully do what we do with our calculus students. Teach them numerical approximation. Teach them to do discrete integration and series in order to sum things up. Now, why does this stuff work and what does it have to do with what we're supposed to be talking about today? Well, one reason why this stuff works is that you can prove that it works. You can write down a simple theorem and then write down a simple proof. For the example that I went over just a minute ago, let's say that you have a constructible function h that is a finite sum of indicator functions over patches. I'm going to call them u sub i. And these u sub i have uniform mass in the sense that they all have the same Euler characteristic. In the example I showed previously, that Euler characteristic was one because they were contractible. But let's say that it's just some constant C. Then the conclusion is if you want to know how many patches there were, you compute the total mass, you integrate the function with respect to Euler characteristic, 
and then you divide by C, the mass of each patch. And the cool thing is, this depends only on H and not how it's decomposed into pieces. You don't need to know anything about the sum. You just look at the function in and of itself. Now, I'm not going to prove this because it's an exercise for you to do, and you're going to be able to prove it in about a minute if you pull out a piece of paper and do what's kind of the obvious thing using the definition for the Euler integral as I've given it. What's cool, again, is that you don't need to see the boundaries. You don't need to see how this is decomposed into pieces with a sufficiently fine sampling or even a really sparse sampling. You can compute that integral, divide by the mass, and then conclude that this signal came from seven patches, seven sources. And that's just the beginning of a lot of really cool applications in signal processing. But that's not really the answer for why this stuff works. The real answer, the deep answer for why this Euler characteristic calculus does what it does is where it comes from. All of the results in Euler calculus were inspired by and flow directly from sheaf theory. The original papers on this stuff by Shapira and Vero independently were taking results in constructible sheaves from Kashiwara and McPherson independently, or respectively rather, and then interpreting them in terms of a calculus with some very nice applications. If you look at Shapira's original papers, they're just rich with all kinds of sometimes difficult to understand sheaf theory, but a particular type of sheaf that is simpler than the general case, sheaves that are sort of constant on pieces or constructible. And that's the inspiration for what I want to talk about in this mini course, which is sheaves that are likewise sort of piecewise constant, simple, even simpler than the type that Shapira and Vero have worked with. Now, sheaf theory is a big subject. Some of you might know a little or a lot about it. I'm going to start from the beginnings because this is a mini course. One interpretation for what a sheaf is, is in terms of a functor, in terms of something called a pre-sheaf. We'll talk about that in a minute. A different interpretation for what a sheaf is or looks like or feels like would be coming from covering space theory. You can think of the atoll space of a sheaf as something like a covering space, although a lot harder to visualize since they're usually not house doors. Finally, you can think about sheaves in terms of gluing local data together into globally consistent data. It's that last interpretation that I'm going to focus on the most in what we do. For my purposes, the way that I think about sheaves, I think of them as data structures, algebraic data structures that are tied to some base space downstairs. In the classical examples, the base space is a topology on a topological space, or maybe, maybe a site on a category. But in the simple applications we're going to do, that base space is going to be a simplicial complex or a cell complex, maybe even just a network. And in the simple settings, the algebraic data is going to be really simple algebraic data, just vector spaces and linear transformations. Most of what I'm going to talk about, for today at least, is going to fall under the category of things that you could very easily teach to undergraduate students in a linear algebra course. In fact, I very much hope to do so someday. But let's get to it. What do I mean when I talk about a simple or a cellular sheaf? Let's let X be a cell complex. Think of a simplicial complex if you like. 
a cellular sheaf, script F, that takes on data valued in some category C is nothing more than a functor from the face poset of that cell complex to the data category. What do I mean by that? I mean that each cell, each vertex, each edge, each face has data, an element of this data category associated to it. Maybe it's a vector space. And there are morphisms or let's say linear transformations from data over vertices to data over incident edges, from data over edges to data over faces. These morphisms, these mappings have to satisfy all the conditions of a functor. That is, if you go two different ways to get to a face, you get to the same thing. So again, real simple setting. I have data over vertices, I have data over edges, and that data is sometimes called the stocks. If I take a cell sigma, then the vector space, the element of the category over that cell is called the stock. The maps between stocks of incident faces you can think of as compatibility constraints. More on that a little bit later. They're just morphisms. They're just, if you like, linear transformations. Now, in the case of a cellular sheaf, data goes from lower dimensional pieces to higher dimensional pieces, vertices to edges, edges to faces. If you know something about sheaf theory, you're a little confused at this point. Shh, I'll explain in a minute. What if you reverse things? Well, of course, if you reverse all the arrows and dualize, you get what is called a co-sheaf. This just means everything contravariant and you're running the arrows backwards. So you're going from data over edges to data over vertices, data over faces to data over edges. Now at this point, there are almost surely some people in the audience who are very much wanting to ask a question. You might even be a little bit upset. You might be saying, you got this all wrong. Restriction maps in sheaf theory are supposed to go from supersets to subsets. You're going from subsets to supersets. That's wrong. Why are you calling this a sheaf? You haven't talked about the gluing axiom. This is just a pre-sheaf. This is just a functor. What are you talking about? OK, I hear you. I hear you. Before you ask the question, let me make the assertion that these cellular sheaves that I'm talking about are in fact honest sheaves and that this subject has a rich history that goes back through the origins of sheaf theory. I can't get into the full history. Cellular sheaf theory has certain premonitions. It was, as far as I know, first really solidly codified in the PhD thesis of Shepard working under McPherson. Then it was forgotten about and then rediscovered by Justin Curry in his thesis. But even if you go back to some of the original books on the subject, like Iverson's book in particular, you see a lot of hints of cellular sheaf theory in there. Now, why do I say that these are in fact sheaves? For experts in the audience who know about the gluing axiom, let me make the following statement. If you look at that gluing axiom and write it in terms of the exactness of this sequence, where you're taking a finite cover of some open set U for a topology over space, and then you're looking at the exactness of the sequence, what you're really doing is building the cellular sheaf over the nerve of this cover. That nerve is a simplicial complex. The cellular sheaf that is induced by that cover needs to accurately approximate the topological sheaf. That is what the gluing axiom means. It means that all cellular approximations are faithful and match. And because you're passing to a nerve, that's why the arrows seem to go the wrong way on the restriction maps. Okay, so if you're an expert, I hope that that explanation helps. If you're not 
an expert, if you're really confused at this point, what did he tell you about gluing axiom exactness, nerve, what? Don't worry about it. Shrug emoji. Forget that I said anything. And we'll just stick to the simple case of thinking in terms of vertices, edges, data over that. And if we're working in vector spaces, this is really just a system of linear transformations. A little bit of terminology. The downstairs space, we're going to call the base space, just like covering space theory. The upstairs data, again, we call those stocks. I'm going to use that terminology throughout. Okay, that's what a cellular sheaf is. Well, what do we do with these things? Well, you build up sheaf theory. I'm going to start with what I think is the, the most important part of sheaf theory, which involves homology and cohomology. Now, we've seen homology. Hopefully, we've all learned homology. We know that cell complexes have homology. And at this point in mathematical history, uh, we, and even people outside of mathematics, now know that the homology of complexes is really useful in a lot of applications. And I think you're hearing a little bit about that in some of the talks at this meeting. But I want you to think back. How did you learn homology? How do you think about homology? When I'm trying to prove theorems, I think in terms of singular homology. That's, of course, the, the right place to work. But when first learning it, I didn't go straight to singular. I found it kind of confusing at first. I did simplicial homology. I did simple examples. I worked through Hatcher. Sheaf theory, when it was invented, jumped over that initial step and went straight to the singular theory without pausing for very long in the simplicial or cellular world. However, it's really easy to both define and do examples of cellular cohomology for sheaves. For concreteness, let's work in the category of vector spaces and linear transformations, but any abelian category is going to be fine. It's really easy to build up a cochain complex as follows. What I'm going to do is take all of the stocks over all the vertices in my complex and just take a big old direct product of those. I'm going to do the same thing for the edge data, for the data over the two cells, the three cells. These are going to be my cochains, choices of data over stocks for the different dimensional cells. I'm going to build a co-boundary operator in the same way that we do in ordinary algebraic topology, using these maps from data over vertices pushing out to data over edges. Again, I'm going to have to <coughs> assign an orientation and get my pluses and minuses straight. But once I've done that, I have a very nice cochain complex where d squared equals 0, and I can pass to the cohomology by taking kernels, mod images, the usual thing. OK, great. What does it mean? We know what homology and cohomology connotes for spaces. They're telling us something about holes in the space. Sheaf cohomology, or co-sheaf homology, is going to tell us about holes or topological features in the data structure. So it's going to have some information about the base space, but also information about the data upstairs. In particular, the zero-dimensional cohomology, very important. It's something like the number of connected components, but connected components in the data structure. These are called global sections of the sheaf. They're best thought of as the number of independent, consistent solutions to the constrained system, where we've programmed the sheaf with all of these restriction maps from vertex data to edge data. Now, higher dimensional sheaf cohomology, it does higher stuff. It gives you obstructions to different types of problems. More on that in later days. And of course, if you reverse all the arrows, you look at a co-sheaf, it has a natural dual homology theory.
Okay, well, just to be really, really explicit, really, really concrete, let's visualize what this looks like. Let's say that I have a cartoon image of stocks over vertices and edges. I have a choice of data over my vertices. And given that distribution, given that zero cochain, I can use the co-boundary operator to measure the difference between the mapped image into the data over the edges. This is just the way the cohomology works. But instead of thinking of cells being matched together, I'm thinking of choices of data being matched or being separated. If I change the choice of data in the vertex stocks, I can get a co-cycle. I can get something where all of the choices match over the edges and that co-boundary vanishes. Okay, that's the intuition for the entire rest of today's talk. The only goal that I have is to do examples, really simple examples, really concrete examples. And this will be the basis for what we talk about tomorrow and the next day, trying to build up more serious theory and more serious applications. All right, I'm going to start with a dumb example, very dumb, really, really simple. I just want a linear transformation between vector spaces. Let me take an interval with two endpoints. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put vector spaces U and V over one of the vertices and the edge, respectively. The other vertex is just going to have a zero. And then I'm going to look at the maps from the vertex data to the edge data. One of those is the zero map. The other is just some linear transformation. This is, um, this is kind of dumb, but if I compute the zero dimensional cohomology, what do I get? I'm looking at the kernel of the co-boundary map. That's really just the kernel of A minus the, what I get from the zero, but whatever, that doesn't do anything. <coughs> What's the one dimensional cohomology? Well, now I need to look at the data over the edges modulo the image of the data from the vertices. That's nothing more than the co-kernel of this linear transformation. So the simple example encodes these simple constructs of kernel and co-kernel. Now imagine a really big complex system where you've built in all of these interesting linear transformations. The cohomology can encode a lot of interesting stuff. All right, that's a dumb example. Let's turn the dial up just a tiny bit. Our base space is going to be still one dimensional and it's just gonna be linear. I'm just going to have uh, the, the real line uh, punctuated by integers where I put the vertices. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to program this sheaf to encode a discrete time linear dynamical system. All of the stocks over the vertices, over the edges, they're all just going to be a copy of Rn, n-dimensional vector space. And what I'm going to do is for data going to the right, I'm going to put a, a square matrix. Uh, let's call it A sub T. And for data from a vertex to the left side, I'm going to use the identity matrix. If I do so with this alternating structure and I look at what it means to be a global section. If I compute the zero dimensional cohomology, then for the data to match up, let me call the data over a vertex x sub t, where t is the integer at which this vertex is located, then the cohomology condition for being a global section is that x sub t plus one has to equal a sub t times x sub t. That's a simple discrete time linear dynamical system that I teach to my engineering students every fall semester. The cohomology classifies the solutions to this dynamical system. Okay, well, again, nothing all that deep there. Simple example. If we want to make things a little more complicated, 
let's say instead of this simple system, I want a linear control system. You're going to have to forgive me. I'm, I'm half engineer. I teach engineering students all the time. When we do control theory, then we're looking at dynamical systems where you've got uh, two variables, x and y. And then uh, you've got a user input u as well. The y is an output variable. You've got not one matrix A, but rather four matrices to encode the interactions between the state variables, the user inputs, the output variables, blah, all this complicated stuff. To program a sheaf to compute solutions to this, you have a couple of choices. You can change the stocks, you can change the base space by putting in these additional edges for user inputs, for observable outputs, and you could change the linear transformations. This looks a little bit complicated, but it's not all that bad. It's just a simple way of using matrices, projection maps, identity maps, in order to encode a complex non-autonomous linear system of discrete time differential equations to arise as the cohomology of this sheaf. Now, this doesn't sound like it's all that relevant to you or your life or useful for anything, but remember this, tomorrow, this will come back. This will come back. Okay, here's something a little less detail, a little more fanciful, but a little more cool. Consider a spline. You know what a, a spline is, right? You, you draw a curve with some sort of piecewise polynomial chunks. A uh, one-dimensional spline is like what you do when you're drawing in a, a drawing program or PowerPoint or something like that. Uh, Two-dimensional splines are what you do when you're an architect and you're making a really cool curved surface or when you're designing the exterior of an automobile. Spaces of splines can be represented in terms of not cellular sheaves, but more naturally cellular co-sheaves. This is something that was discovered by Bilera in the early 1990s to solve the problem of classifying the space of polynomial splines, or either curves, surfaces, whatever dimension you want. Take some, let's say, triangulation of a disk and start fixing some degrees. Let's say I want cubic two-dimensional patches that meet along the edges with a certain degree of smoothness. How many degrees of freedom do you have? What's the dimension of the space of all such splines? The way that Bellera solved this was by saying, hey, you know what? I just came up with this cool homology theory. And let me just define it by fiat. Here's the, the chain complex. And he proved a theorem that said, you know what, the top dimensional homology of this chain complex is classifying the space of splines. In retrospect, looking at it from the perspective of the future, what he was really doing was building a cellular co-sheaf and then using the top dimensional homology to classify global solutions. To do the details of this would take us a bit far afield. I can do a simpler example where everything is explicit and you can do the computations. Consider the case of a Bezier curve. Maybe you've seen this if you've ever used a drawing program where what you do is you set a couple of endpoints and then you draw, let's say a cubic Bezier curve where what you do is you've got those uh, uh, control points and you drag the handles around. Maybe you've done that if you use any kind of drawing program. I spent a lot of time in drawing programs. There's a way to set this up as a co-sheaf over an interval. Very simple. For the vertices, all I do is look at their position in, let's say, the plane. So the stock over each vertex is just the plane. I can put them anywhere I want. What about the edge? Well, for a cubic spline, then the x coordinate is a cubic polynomial and the y coordinate is a cubic polynomial. Cubic polynomials have one, two, three, four degrees of freedom. 
So the stock over the edge is really the direct sum of R4 with R4, splitting in terms of the X and Y coordinates respectively. This is a co-sheaf because the data maps out from the edges to the vertices. This mapping is just evaluation. If I set the cubic spline for the interior edge, then it gets evaluated at the endpoints. Okay, since this is a co-sheaf, it has homology. What's the zero-dimensional homology? Well, let's see. Um, I need the kernel of the thing, modulo the image of the thing. Oh, is this evaluation mapping onto? Yeah, it it is. So nothing much going on there. What about the top dimensional homology, the thing that classifies the space of splines, or in this case, that classifies the Bezier curves? Well, since it's onto, you can do a dimension count. And let's see, I've got R4, direct sum R4, going to R2, direct sum R2. I have four degrees of freedom that splits naturally into two and two. That really is parameterizing the control points for the handles in this Bezier curve. So you move those handles around, it changes the splines. That is moving around in the one-dimensional homology of this co-sheaf. That's the space of Bezier curves. And this generalizes the higher dimensions really nicely. Here's a an example that's not too unrelated that, again, starts off simple, but in higher dimensions, this gets very deep. This is the beginnings of some joint work with my student, Zoe Cooperband, but which in this simple case reflects earlier work of Crapo and Whiteley. Let's say that you look at a truss. That is, you have a collection of rigid rods in the plane, in three space, whatever. And you're looking at doing statics, looking at force balancing of these rigid rods. You can build what is called a force co-sheaf associated to this. What's the stock over a vertex? The stock over a vertex keeps track of what forces are being applied at that joint. If you're in an n-dimensional space, the plane, 3D, whatever, that stock is 2D or 3D or whatever. It's just Rn. That means that the zero-dimensional co-chains are giving you distributions of loads on the vertices, forces. What about the edges? Well, the stock over an edge is going to be one-dimensional, and it's going to measure the internal stress, either um, tension or compression, depending on whether it's positive or negative. That means that the one-dimensional chains are keeping track of all the axial stresses in this linkage, in this truss. Now, the interesting thing is what's the map from one-dimensional data to zero-dimensional data. It's just transferring the stress from the edge applied as a force on the vertex but you do this over the entire truss. When you do that, then you can get that the one-dimensional homology keeps track of all the self-stresses, that is net zero forces at the, at the vertices, the kind of thing you do in statics class. And the zero-dimensional homology is encoding all of the flexibility or the degrees of freedom of the truss. This is really cool. Why? This simple co-sheaf allows you to extract some very interesting, if old, results. The following is called Maxwell's Rule. It goes back to the 1860s and was used for a long time as just a rule of thumb by engineers. It says if you've got a truss in 2D, 3D, whatever dimensions, dimension N, then if you want to know how many degrees of freedom your linkage has, that is the dimension of h lower zero, you compute the number of independent self-stresses, you subtract the number of beams, and you add the number of joints times the dimension that you're working in. 
Again, this was just a rule of thumb that Maxwell wrote down. When it's taught in engineering school, it's taught using counting arguments. But you and I can look at that and we recognize immediately what's going on. Oh, this is the Euler characteristic of this co-sheaf. That's one of the things that sheaves and co-sheaves are good for is giving you a nice unified language for simplifying other results, more complicated results. Now, there's a gazillion other examples that we could talk about. We could talk about network flow sheaves and the max flow min cut theorem. We could talk about more theoretical examples, things involving uh, fibers of projection maps. These are called Larray sheaves or co-sheaves by Justin Curry. This relates to Morse theory, to persistent homology, to all kinds of things. If you start getting into things like stratified Morse theory, then the local homology or local cohomology gives you one of these piecewise constant sheaves over a variety. Lots of really cool stuff in there. But what I would like to do is a slightly more detailed example to close things out, one that we're going to build on tomorrow. This is an example that has to do with opinions and opinion dynamics. This is a very hot topic in applied mathematics and network science right now. Let's say you have a social network of individuals. I'm going to model that as an undirected graph. So it's more like Facebook, less like Twitter, right? Following is mutual. And everybody is going to have an opinion on some topic. I, I dare not even say what, what topics we should have opinions on, but let's say you pick some topic, everybody has an opinion on it and model it as a scalar. So maybe it's a strong negative or a strong positive, or maybe it's a zero, which means, ah, I don't really care, I don't really have an opinion. If you do that and scalarize these opinions, then the question is, what happens to people's opinions over time? This is the problem of opinion dynamics. Maybe you have a situation where everyone starts off with their priors and they talk to each other. And after time, maybe the system becomes polarized. You get subgroups of people with really strong opinions. Or maybe things sort of spread out and moderate over time, and everyone comes to agreement, just like what happens on Facebook and Twitter all the time, or maybe not. There is a ton of work that's been done on opinion dynamics, a lot of which recently is focused on more complex examples where you have, let's say, multiple opinions, where you, you're only allowed to influence someone if you, if you have a certain degree of trust for them, or if they're close enough to your opinion, what happens if you get people who are sort of antagonistic, who are trying to spread propaganda? What about people who are more or less susceptible to influence? Lots of interesting work on this subject. One of the really cool examples of cellular sheaves that has some impact in this, and that gives a different, more topological way to approach the subject, is something that Jacob Hansen and I have called a discourse sheaf. Let me go over this somewhat briefly. The idea is the following. Our base space is going to be a social network modeled as a graph, and we're going to have data over vertices and edges. The vertex stocks are vector spaces, opinion spaces that have a basis. The basis is a collection of private basis topics that I care about a lot. I've got my basis opinions, things that I, I have very definite opinions on. Maybe you've got your things that you really care about, and it might be very different than what I care about. They might not even be the same dimension spaces. They might have totally different bases. But when we are talking, when we're doing politics, when we're discussing something, there are one or more topics under discussion. These topics are going to be the basis for the discourse 
space, the stalks over the edges. Now, what you and I debate may be very different than what you and the person sitting next to you are debating about. That's totally fine. We can have a completely heterogeneous system. This is the, exactly the kind of thing that a sheaf was built to do, to have very different data over different cells. Now, what's really interesting are the maps from the private basis opinions to the public discourse. This is an expression of opinion. Now, we're assuming, because we're working in the category of vector spaces and linear transformations, that these are linear maps. That is, if I feel twice as strong about a basis opinion, about all my basis opinions, then I'm going to express my belief about the current thing with twice the fortitude. That's not necessarily realistic, but it's not entirely unrealistic. What is interesting is that individuals can choose to formulate beliefs, to express their opinions in very, very different manners and in very private manners. This is kind of interesting. So again, just a, a, a simple example. If, if the topic for discussion is, hey, should we, should we walk to town and get some food? Then the things that you might really uh, be thinking about, your basis opinions might be about how much you like to walk and about how hungry you are. And you might be kind of hungry, but you might not be in the mood for walking. And so you might express a weak um, assent to the idea of going to walk for some food. Me, on the other hand, I'm thinking about going to a pub. I'm thinking about going to an Indian buffet. I haven't had breakfast yet. I'm kind of hungry. It's too early here for a pub. It's too early here for an Indian buffet. But still, let me move to your time. Yeah. I'm in, let's go. I would love to get some food. Let's go walking. I don't, I don't really care about the walking part so much. And that's kind of a dumb example. But if you think about it, there are some not dumb examples that this model is really flexible enough to incorporate. For example, this model allows people to exaggerate their beliefs, to say that they believe something very, very strongly when in fact, um, you know, in, in private, they don't have quite as strong a belief. This model allows people to outright lie. If let's say we had a, an example where all the stocks were one dimensional and everyone's talking about the same thing, I could just instead of using an identity map to express my belief, I could use minus the identity. I could lie, say the exact opposite of what I believe. And I could do so selectively. I could tell the truth to some people and I could lie to other people. This is one of the cool things about what a sheaf can do. Now, if you think about all of the sort of basic components that we've talked about in cellular sheaf theory, it has very nice interpretations in this context. Zero cochains are distributions of personal or private opinions. One cochains are distributions of pairwise beliefs, pairwise public discussions. The co-boundary operator from zero dimensional cochains to one dimensional cochains is telling you something about the aggregate public disagreement, since it's measuring the differences in expressed beliefs. And if we look at the zero dimensional cohomology, the global sections, these are precisely opinion distributions that when expressed lead to harmony, lead to everybody being in agreement. I think that this example is a really nice example for being able to illustrate the richness of what you can do with programming a cellular sheaf, with trying to explain to people what 
global sections mean, what a co-boundary operator means. And since we're just getting started, there's a lot more that one can do. Now, in today's talk, I've, co I've covered some simple examples, some simple examples. There are a lot, a lot of other examples of cellular sheaves being used in different contexts that I haven't talked about. Some of these I'll hit on later. Some of these, there just won't be time to go into all the details, but this is very much a interesting and increasingly useful little tiny corner of sheaf theory. I'll say more about that tomorrow. At this time, I would like to thank you for your patience and take any questions you might have.